Residents of Lati Kunda Savage rehabilitated a feeder road linking the Kanifi municipality and Brickhammer. Gambia is set to host a meeting of African religious ministers and ulamas under the team Promotion of Peace, Understanding and Unity among Communities and Nations. And Russia's selling of Ukrainian power supply stations continue to disrupt normal operations in the country. Well, this and more coming your way on this week. Many thanks for joining us. This is Africa TV and I am Amadou Kante and now the news in details. Now in what is becoming a reality in the Gambia, residents of Latri Kunda Sabiji have resuscitated a decades old community spirit of pulling together known in the Gambia as Tesito by turning out in large numbers to rehabilitate the border road between the Kanifing municipality and the Brikama area council. Now, the road stands as a crucial point as it serves as a diversion of vehicles going to Nemakunku and Costa Road, but it had been badly dilapidated by the latest or the last rains, uh, making travels difficult for commuters. Mafuji Sinse went along and he files in this report. The road in Quakeson links the Kanifi municipality and the Brikama area council settlements of Nemakunku and the coastal road. But it was badly damaged by the last rain, which were exceptionally heavy, making travel a lot harder for commuters here. Today, though, residents of Latikunda Sabiji have decided to take matters into their own hands by coming out in numbers to rehabilitate the road and make it usable once again. The National Assembly member for the area is Honorable Yaya Sanyang, who expressed delight in the large turnout, saying development all over the world is usually done by the indigents themselves. He went on further to make an appeal for more assistance to his community. Uh, the amount of youths present here, the amount of elderly people present here, the amount of women pre uh, present here is telling me that uh, this part of uh, Latikunda Sabaji Arjanlanding, uh, people are very united and they are united uh, for a purpose. Uh, they are united for development and they are united for progress. Uh, the only thing that I can now add on top of that is we are still appealing to donors, anybody who is watching this news and you are a donor, uh, we, we, are, we still need thousands and thousands of dollars to complete this road project. Because according to them, this is not the only intervention they want to do. They want to cover several, several parts in the community as well. So I am appealing to all the individual donors or group of donors. I'm the National Assembly member for this particular constituency farm. I'm appealing to them. My office is appealing to them. Their CAFO is appealing to them to help them to realize this aims and objective. So I am exceedingly excited and I encourage the people uh, uh, of this area to do this on and on and on because the sky is going to be the limit. The responsibility to develop feeder roads usually falls under the mandate of area councils and not the central government. As primary tax collectors, they are mandated by law to plough some of that money back for infrastructural development within the communities. This has not been the case as the Brickham Area Council, which collects the larger chunk of revenue in the concerned area, has done nothing for the inhabitants. The council of Olatikunda Sabiji, Ward and Sumana Bayo, took part in the road rehabilitation, but his counterparts from the Brikama Area Council did not show up. Ansumana Bayo therefore urged the Brikama Area Council to up their game and do the needful. It's there where their students, students will go to school, their women will go to our Latikunda Sabiji market, you understand. And uh, uh, because if you look at their um, regional capital, which is Brikama, they are very far from Brikama, so they are very close. Even the, our refuse trucks, you know, it collects both their refuse, where we are, they are not in our side. But as far as those residents are at the border, so we deem it necessary that as far as Gambia is concerned, so their refuse also should be collected by them. 
not to us, but I'm providing that service for West Coast region. So I wish if they are aware about this, I think they will thank Kanifi municipality and then emulate our Lord Mayor's vision because he is the one who initiated these refuse trucks to be shared among all the 19 wards. There is no ward in KMC that has no truck of its own. Latekunda Sabiji's truck is here to collect the refuse of Latekunda Sabiji. We are not supposed to go to West Coast region, but being at the border point, we allow them to throw their refuse simply because if they have, uh, like us, we would have not collected their refuse. But as far as Gambia is concerned, and they are our close neighbors, so we collect their refuse, we provide services for them. Serif Job is an elder and ward development chairman in Latikuna Sabiji. As ward development chairman, it's his office duty to handle challenges of this nature. Man Manika, um, ward development chairman, we? When the community saw that the state of the road was bad, they wrote donation letters to people they believe can help in seeking support to rehabilitate it. Through the community association and the ward council and Sumana Bayon, we were able to get donations which we initialized properly and transparently. It's from these funds that we got stones to do this rehabilitation. But we are still asking for more donations to rehabilitate other roads to respectable standards for easy movement of goods and services. It's clear from what one sees here that the United Community can help transform itself by initiating projects that are tailored made for its development. The spirit here may be high, but the tax is daunting, and this community will surely need a lot more help to tackle the bad state of feeder roads in the area. Mafuj Sise, Africa News. Great initiative there by the people of Lache Kunda Savage. Now moving on, to the recent selling of Ukrainian power supply stations by Russia has severely disrupted normal activities in the European country as citizens struggle to access electricity. Now amid this situation, authorities have provided temporary power supply centers where people could meet to conduct their usual services. The lack of adequate electricity supply has become a nightmare for millions of households, especially vulnerable groups. Let's have more details of that in this report. Ludmila Dazuk comes to this temporary centre every day. She has no electricity at home, but at this place she has internet access throughout the day. As a sales manager, she plans to stay here until her work is complete. I can't even imagine how it would be without this place, because my work is dependent on electricity. I'm communicating with clients from all over Ukraine using my laptop, so if I can't work, it will affect my salary. The less you sell, the less you earn. <laughs> Hundreds of these centers have opened up across Ukraine. They're known as points of invincibility and provide electricity, heat, and even food and drink to everyone for free. It's part of a pledge by President Volodymyr Zelensky to keep life running as smoothly as possible in the face of missile strikes on the country's power stations. At the moment, Ukraine is only producing 70% of the electricity it needs. Around two-thirds of that is being used to maintain essential services such as hospitals and businesses. And that is why millions of households across the country are still experiencing scheduled power cuts. And the Kyiv region is one of the worst hit. For the elderly and vulnerable, a lack of electricity can have serious consequences. Mikoyla Motruk queues up in the freezing cold for a small tub of soup every day. The 62-year-old retired engineer lives alone. Without the help of local charities, he would not be able to eat. I can't cook because I have an electric cooker, so this is my first hot meal in two days. The power cuts have really affected my life. At least I have cold water now though. Before, there was no water at all. My life has turned upside down. Authorities say it could take up to eight months to restore the country's entire electricity grid. Until then, Mikola and others like him have no choice but to depend on the help of others to get by. And from the report there in Ukraine, back to matters here in the Gambia, because freedom of expression is a prerequisite in a democratic dispensation. 
It allows for pluralism where citizens can dialogue, in some instances engage in critical analysis of political, economic, and social climate prevailing within a state. Freedom of expression also means that citizens can, if they so choose, to manifest their anger over issues by protesting in the streets. The government, on the other hand, is responsible to safeguard and protect these fundamental rights of its citizens. The Gambia under President Barrow has not been too tolerant of protestation, and this, according to John Charles Njai, chairperson of civil society organization, is a stain on the democratic credentials of the current government. Mariam Cham has more details of that in this report. In the Gambia, protests are allowed by law, but they must be sanctioned and controlled by the state as per the Public Order Act. Protest organizers are required by law to seek permission from a government official, and they must also identify the protest route they intend to take, as well as time of the protest to ensure a well-coordinated manifestation on the police escort. While this may seem like allowing for a peaceful manifestation, this legal provision also allows government officials to deny permits to groups and organizations that are either opposed to it or who simply want to express their concern about a grave national issue from pouring out into the streets to protest. And for John Charles Ngai, chairperson of civil society organizations, this legal bottleneck added to the current heavy-handedness towards anti-government protesters in the country is a stain on the democratic credentials of the Adam Barrow-led government. The Gambian people must be allowed to express themselves freely and responsibly. I know the president made a statement that when he wins and comes into power, that protests are going to be stopped. And we see signs that there is a deliberateness from the security outfits to quell protests. Under the rule of former President Yaya Jame, security forces were often used to quell protests. John Charles Yaya reminds members of the security forces that the Gambia cannot return to those days. You know, after 22 years being caged, after 22 years when the men in this country were accused of not being men, and after the Gambian people have done what is right by them in December of 2016, I see no institution, no government, no security outfit that can take the Gambian people back to 22 years of dictatorship. So let me advise the men and women in the security, you cannot cage the Gambian people. John Charles Njai therefore warns the Gambia government to be responsive to the plight of Gambians as a failure to do so will have undesired consequences. If the government of the Gambia fails to hear the voices of the masses, if the government fails to hear the cries of the poor people, if the government fails to hear that there are people going to bed hungry at night and waking up in the morning hungry, if the government fails to hear that the people are tired, the people are distressed, that the young people are unemployed and prices keep rising. If the government fails to hear the cry of the Gambian people, then they will have what will come to them. So allow the people to express themselves in protest. Democratic governments allow for divergent views on an area of issues, and that is good for social, political, and economic advancement, says John Charles Ngai. There is absolutely nothing wrong with people defying opinion, saying so responsibly. Reporting for iAfrica News, I am Maria Macham. And from the report there by Maria Macham, now to some of the news still though here in the country, because the Honorable Minister of Finance on the Friday presented the 2023 budget to the National Assembly. Revenue and expenditure have both increased by 18 and 14 percent respectively. But in the deficit, is, as a percent of GDP, is estimated to decline as compared to 2022. Moses Mendy has more details of that in this report. The increase in revenue by 18% for 2023 means the Gambia is set to collect more money next year, but expenditure will also increase by 14% on the other hand. 
the Honorable Minister of Finance, C.D. Keita, attributed the increments to improvements in revenue administration and increase in capital expenditure on key infrastructure projects in the Gambia. The salient features of the 2023 budget. One, the, in, the budget reflects an increase in revenue by 18% on the back of improvements in the revenue administration and collection through digitalization of the GRA and the Senegambia Bridge, among others. Increase to increase in expenditure by 14%, mostly attributable to uh, increases in capital expenditure on key infrastructure projects in both rural and urban Gambia. There is an estimated improvement of 1.5% decline in the budget deficit for 2023 as compared to the 2022 figures. This decline is to consolidate the government's aims to reduce net borrowing. The agriculture sector is crucial because it plays a primary role in the economy. In a move to boost the performance of the sector, the government has increased allocation to the sector by 69% from 2022. A number of medium-term policy reforms to ensure fiscal sustainability and improve future conditions in terms of revenue and expenditure management are entailed in the 2023 budget. Finance Minister Sidi Keita outlined some of those expected reforms. Development of a travel policy for the entire public service to ensure value for money. Two, extension of the performance contract to all state-owned enterprise with a view to improving their financial viability, service delivery, and reducing fiscal risk to the budget. Three, strengthening of the public investment program through institutionalization of medium-term public investment programs for all sectors and ensuring all public investments pass the Gambia Strategic Review Board selection criteria. Restructuring and rationalization of subvented entities. Development of a domestic resource mobilization strategy to enhance revenue collection development of a foreign service policy with the aim of rationalizing foreign missions, finalization of the vehicle policy and commencement of implementation of its implementation as a matter of urgency in order to rationalize expenditure on the purchase of vehicles, fuel and maintenance. These will be managed to address the concern of the most vulnerable elements, particularly the existing drivers. Faster growth in gross domestic product, GDP, expands the overall size of the economy and strengthens the fiscal situation of the country. Such successes are essential to the Gambia as it faces uncertainties in the post-pandemic economic landscape. For iAfrica News, I am Moses Imende. This is iAfrica TV and you are watching this week's news edition coming to you live from our students in Banchul and from that report by Moses Mendy and matters of the National Assembly. We now take a break and come back shortly. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Under the auspices of the President, His Excellency Adam Abaro, the Muslim World League, in collaboration with the Gambia government, will host the Conference of African Religious Ministers and Ulamas on the 6th of December 2022. The International Islamic Conference will bring together ministers of religious affairs, leading Islamic scholars, policymakers, youths, community leaders across Africa to discuss and advance Islamic values that promote peace and tolerance. Let's come together and welcome our brothers and sisters in keeping with our trademark hospitality at the Smiling Coast of Africa. This message is brought to you by the Ministry responsible for religious affairs in collaboration with the Gambia OIC Secretary.
Welcome back, and you are watching this week's news edition on Africa TV coming to you live from the Gambia. And let's now look at the rest of the stories. A meeting of African religious ministers and ulamas is said to be hosted by the Gambia on the 6th of December 2022. The Banjul Conference is organized by the Muslim World League in collaboration with the government of the Gambia under the team Promotion of Peace, Understanding and Unity Among Communities and Nations. The Ministry of Lands, Regional Government, Religions and NGO Affairs, in collaboration with the Gambia OIC Secretariat, Thursday morning called a press conference to see it light on the forthcoming event. Mafuji Sese has more details of that in this report. Pia Sanyang at the Ministry of Local Government and Lands, Buba Sanyang, has confirmed that out of the 54 African countries, 38 countries have confirmed their attendance for the December 6th Banjul Conference of African Religious Ministers and Ulamas. Pia Sanyang was, however, quick to state that the number might increase at any point. He said out of the 38 countries, there are 81 participants, among which will be nine ministers, with the highest number of participants coming from Mauritania. So we feel we need to just use those structures to roll out and then implement this particular conference. As of now, the 54 African countries invited, we have received up to 38 countries confirming their presence. This might increase as we go, but then also out of these 38 countries, we have 81 participants. Among them, we have nine ministers. The highest number of participants will come from Mauritania, as of now, with eight. It may increase, or other countries might also increase, based on the arrangement with the um, uh, Muslim World League Secretariat. Binta Jame Sidibeng, the chairperson of all the subcommittees of the organizing secretaries of the Muslim world, says the Gambia inhabits different faiths, including traditional believers and all faith groups, needs to be considered. She announced that accommodation for all the guests have been secured and that protocol officers have been trained. Because guests, they have to be accommodated. Uh, rooms have to be available for them, they have to be met at the airport. The accommodation committee is, has also been working tirelessly to ensure that the rooms are available. As we know, the time that we are, is the third season, but we have been able to uh, manage to get hotels reserved for them and all the hotels have been paid for. We also have the protocol. As you know, the protocol is very important to receive guests. Even two days ago, we had a very good training for the protocol and the ushers, so that they can be able to organize very well the city <coughs> arrangements and how to receive the guests at the airport, from the airport to the hotels and then to the conference center, because we are going to have very, very high level um, guests coming in. Then we also have the transport committee. These are all very important to any conference of this nature, to get them the different kinds of vehicles, the VVIPs, so that our ministers come in, our high-level ulemas come in from different countries because we'll have other special guests, apart from the ministers of religious affairs, we'll have special guests from the Saudi Arabia and other countries like Mauritania. The Banjul Conference will be the first of its kind, organized by the Muslim World League in the West Africa region. The Islamic Conference is motivated by the Gambia's religious tolerance. The conference will also serve as a platform for enlightenment for Muslims, scholars to understand that in us their opinion matter, those the opinion of others. The question that will linger on will be whether the conference will be able to bring about inter and intra-faith dialogue between Muslims and non-Muslims as well as between Muslims of different sects. Mafun Sise, I African News. Now, moving on, stakeholders of South Africa's oil industry have welcomed the French energy giant Total plans to explore the country's oil offshore on the West Coast. Now, according to some players, the move will remedy or will help remedy the uh, prolonged energy crisis faced by the country. As despite the expected positive outcome, there has been some reservations against the planned exploration amid environmental concerns. Here's more details of that in this report. 
Total Energies is on the hunt and they plan to look for oil along South Africa's west coast in the deep water Orange Basin. The exploration will see the company drill one well that could lead to a further nine wells if the first one proves successful. The move has been welcomed by energy stakeholders as a step in the right direction for South Africa's energy independence. What Total Energies is doing is actually providing solutions. They would be able to, to, dis, to discover huge amount of um, oil and huge amount of gas. Don't, don't forget that they already discovered huge amounts of crude condensate, which they can also develop gas that could fix South Africa's energy crisis right here in South Africa and also fix the energy crisis in Europe and everywhere. As part of the exploration, Total Energies will drill waters as deep as 3,000 meters and the drilling will take place 188 kilometers from the coast. Environmental groups though are up in arms. They believe that the drilling could have a negative impact on the surrounding marine life and jobs as well. Well, for us is that there, there should be no any seismic testing done on the coastline. Our coastline is enriched with a lot of marine life. We have created, there's millions of jobs that have been created. And the oil and gas industry that's rushing over here uh, to to um, destroy our coastline that's not welcome. Let me say that clearly. And communities all over the coastline, from the borders of Mozambique to our borders in the Northern Cape. While many lawsuits have been launched against energy companies hoping to explore for oil and gas reserves along the country's coastline, it remains unclear if the West Coast exploration will attract equal litigation. Total Energies and Shell PLC have earlier this year made significant oil discoveries north of the block in Namibian waters. So South Africa's west coast seems promising. Environmental groups though, have in the past successfully altered energy companies from exploring for oil and gas along South Africa's coastline through the court system. So that could be their course of action. Oil related report is coming from South Africa. On to our final story next. Because the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, has given life-sustaining supplies to more than 600,000 people in the Somali region of Ethiopia. Now, the, the support aims to help vulnerable farmers get through the worst drought in 40 years. Moses Imen tells us more in the support. The UN's FAO support to more than 138,000 households comprising 691,000 people in the Somali region of Ethiopia is to help vulnerable farmers get through the worst drought in 40 years. In total, the organization will have assisted up to 1.5 million households comprising 7.5 million people in need across the entire country by the end of the year. Farmers in the region received locally adapted seeds of different types of crops and fodder, good quality fertilizers, supplementary animal feed for livestock, animal health service and cash support. To have first-hand information of the reality on the ground, FAO's emergency director Rain Paulson visited the drought-affected region, where he said technical support and local engagement are the factors capable of making a meaningful change. When there is drought, it doesn't mean there's no rain. It can come late, it can be badly distributed. But with the right types of inputs and technical support and local engagement, uh, we can make a meaningful change. And this is much better than just handing out food assistance. This is vulnerable families being able to produce for themselves, and the results are really incredible. Despite the hostile weather, farmers were still able to cultivate crops in the region, and this, according to Paulson, is impressive. What's so impressive is that the wheat that's growing here behind, uh, it's possible to grow even in challenging circumstances. This farming family told us how they've lost half of their cows, they've lost the majority of their sheep, they're having to shift to cultivation, but it's working. Even though the rains came late, we were able to provide high quality seeds, fertilizer, and some cash support uh, to get the family through the worst period of uh, the lean season and this wheat is in fantastic condition. 17 out of 24 million people living in drought affected areas are targeted for assistance until the end of the year while 8.1 million people were targeted earlier in the year. However, more than 10 million people remain in need of urgent food assistance prompting pulsing to call for a much improved emergency response system and to fixate focus on resilience immediately.
This is a historic drought. We need better emergency response and we need to focus on resilience immediately. The resilience work can't wait. FAO and partners are implementing. The overall interagency drought plan for Ethiopia appealed for 132.7 million US dollars and received 60 million so far, leaving a gap of 72.7 million US dollars. Over the last few years, many of the drought affected communities, mostly pastoralists and agro pastoralists, have experienced multiple shocks, including conflict and hindered the movement of critical aid supplies such as food and nutrition items. For iAfrica News, I am Moses Imeni. And you have been watching the, of course, this week's news edition on iAfrica TV from the, our studios in Banchil and from the report there by Moses Imeni. We now bring this news edition to an end, but for more details on this and other stories, as always, as ever, you can visit on our website on africa.tv. But for now, many thanks for the privilege of your company. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and do have a pleasant evening. Bye for now.